All right, um, our next presenter is Michael Breen. He's a professor at Reed College and a Brown University PhD, so he's outside the circle of Georgetown. We've let several in. Um, and his presentation today is Law, Politics, and the Social History of the Ancien Regime State. All right. So yes, <clears throat> so I have a computer, but no images, or there'll be no technical yeah. problems here, in case you're worried about that. Um, so as Sarah just said, um, I'm not a student of Jim's, um, although in many ways I might as well have been, because I've learned so much from him and his works over the course of my career, um, not just about French history and the history of the early modern state, which is an interest we share, but also the realities of the academic profession, uh, the vagaries of academic publishing, and perhaps a thing or two about fine dining establishments in <laughs> Paris, Dijon, the Burg and the Burgundian countryside. In fact, I can still remember one time when I, in one summer I was in Dijon just getting a call one Sunday morning from Jim saying, hey, I've got a car, let's go kind of tootle around the countryside. And we ended up, you know, he, there was some restaurant he wanted to try. And as I recall, we ended up in Otan and, and, you know, had a very sort of pleasant day. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, sort of preparing this talk reminded me of the first time I met Jim Collins, uh, which was nearly a quarter century ago uh, at a conference in Toulouse on Le Parlement de de Provence. It's also, I think, where I first met Sarah. Um, I had recently finished researching my dissertation on lawyers and local politics in early modern Dijon, um, which later became a book in the series Jim and Mac Holt edit for uh, Rochester. Uh, and I was giving my first paper based on that research. Uh, and it was on the La Pensée Politique des Avocats au Parlement de Dijon. And it was a sort of very preliminary graduate student attempt at understanding how um, a group of educated, politically active, but largely non-elite provincial legal professionals understood the nature of political power and the workings of the early modern French state. Uh, and in particular, I was interested in sort of three factors and how, how they shaped their thought. Um, their educational background, in particular their legal training, which familiarized them with the concepts languages and practices that provided the theoretical underpinning of the old regime state and its institutions and procedures of governance. Uh, their membership in Dijon's notability, that is the sort of well-to-do and respectable members of local society who served as social, cultural, and political mediaries between um, the provincial elite, that is the sort of nobles, the, uh, the parliamentaires, and the royal officials at the apex of regional society, uh, and the broader urban populace. And finally, their active role in local political life, uh, especially at the city's powerful but embattled mairie, which necessarily prompted them to reflect upon the foundations and extent of the municipality's powers and its ever-shifting relationship to other authorities, such as the estates of Burgundy, the parliament, the other sovereign courts, and even the monarchy itself. So even if I couldn't quite articulate it back then, uh, I was interested in and have remained interested in my career um, through what, uh, in what Jim aptly describes in the preface to his recently pol uh, published La Monarchie Républicaine, his, uh, his lectures at the Collège de France, as the history of the state considered as a social fact. That is, as I take it, the state not only as the amalgam of overlapping, intersecting institu institutions and individuals exercising public authority, but also the constellation of private, familial, and corporate interests and social power relations in which they operated. Politics, as Jim constantly reminds us, is as much the product of human actors and their interpersonal relations as it is the result of social, economic, and other forces. Uh, and this leads Jim to a second related observation that political ideas and discourses are inextricably linked to live polit lived political experiences of their producers. Again, I don't know if I could have articulated that thought nearly a quarter century go uh, ago in Toulouse. Uh, I was just trying to be halfway comprehensible to a French audience, after all. Uh, but after decades of studying the relationship between law and politics in early modern France, I think Jim is absolutely correct when he argues that political texts must be read not only in light of the intellectual and linguistic context in which they were produced, as Quentin Skinner and the Cambridge School insist, but also in light of the constellation of power relations they were inscribed in. 
So in the few minutes I have left here, um, I just want to say a few words uh, relating these two observation of Jim, two observations of Jim's, to our understanding of the pervasive yet still somewhat ambiguous place of the law in old regime French state and society. This is a subject that has received a considerable amount of attention in recent years. In so doing, I want to build off Amelia Kessler's perceptive observation that law is, quote, the conduit between discourse and practice, a set of socially sanctioned institutions and practices for debating and then implementing differing conceptions of the social good. Or to put it slightly differently, law understood not only as the ensemble of normative texts, terms, and ideas that regulate social life, but also the constellation of institutions, actors, and procedures that give those norms and concepts practical effect is a social fact, one in which concepts and discourses with inherently political implications are inextricably intertwined with practices and lived experiences suffused with similarly political implications. As sites where ordinary men and women were most likely to interact with representatives of official authority, the old regime's courts of law, which may have numbered in the vicinity of 20 to 30,000, or one for every four to 600 inhabitants, were the primary nexus of interaction between state and society. It's well known that courts performed a variety of administrative and regulatory functions that went well beyond the provision of civil and criminal justice, overseeing markets, registering wills and debt transactions, and, insurance, and ensuring the maintenance of good order, or la police. But beyond that, they were sites where various actors, judges, lawyers, litigants, witnesses, and the broader community at large continuously debated, contested, and enacted their competing understandings of le bien public, and did so in the procedural, conceptual, rhetorical, and symbolic language provided by the law. Legal systems, as the anthropologist Lawrence Rosen reminds us, are nothing if they are not forums for capturing the terms of discussion. Now, one of the benefits of using the law, broadly conceived, not only in terms of juridical texts and principles, but as a set of social relations and cultural practices, to analyze the political history of the old regime, is that the law was extraordinary, fl extraordinarily flexible and malleable phenomenon. Far from being rigid and defined, which is how we often think about it, it was susceptible to being used in a variety of different ways by a variety of different actors in a range of different contexts. In his Conference on Jean Baudin in La Monarchie Républicaine, Collins invokes Pierre Bourdieu's insight that l'état n'est pas un bloc, c'est un champ. For Bourdieu, the law too is a field, one he describes as being comprised of a socially recognized actors possessing a technical competence that empowers them to interpret a corpus of texts, sanctifying a correct or legitimated vision of the social world. So I think there's sort of, a, if, I ha if I were um, more technologically inclined, I'd put a Venn diagram up there or something kind of showing the overlap between the two fields, but um, I'm not so technically inclined. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and just to give a couple of examples of, I think, this sort of, the, the, this sort of range and flexibility um, at the cent, you know, sort of looking at the center, for instance, and here I'm just I'm referring to and drawing on um, Marie Hulemer's book on the um, the politique de la parole, uh, which is a book I know Jim is very fond of, and I am as well. Um, Hulemer's study uh, emphasizes of the 16th century Parliament emphasizes its sort of fluidity and instability as an institution, insisting that it be understood as an uh, an effort of, uh, by men to organize society um, and as a product of a kind of, sedi of sedimentation of usages and not as a fixed kind of um, sort of you know, immobile block. Um, it's an institution, she describes it as an institution of speech, a space of dialogue. So that is a space of dialogue, not only between the parliament and the monarchy, but among the sort of members of the parliament themselves, the various actors of the parliaments, the judges, the lawyers, um, and others, who are constantly sort of re-debating and redefining and reconsidering what le bien public was and what their place uh, in, in that sort of process was. 
At the upper end of the ladder, judges saw themselves as Roman magistrates and lawyers saw themselves as Roman orators, not mere technicians of the law, but as own politique, whose legal expertise and personal character entitled them to debate issues concerning the nature of the public good, the proper distribution of wealth, power, and other resources, and the nature of public order. At the periphery, out in the provinces, law provided the context for similar debates, even if these were held in a different context and took place in a much different register. And here I'm sort of alluding to, for instance, Julie Hardwick's excellent book about what she calls litigation communities uh, among work, the working class communities of Lyon and Nantes. The members of these litigation communities were engaged, Hardwick argues, in a public dialogue about matters that were of critical importance to household, neighborhoods, and the state. The possibility of litigation as well as participation in the process, she argues, offered an expansive and very open forum in which working people debated key issues, including the limits of male familial authority, the proper management of household finances, the rights of women within the conjugal unit. In the, in the legal, public, and political forums of litigation, Hardwick explains, witnesses and parties articulated grassroots understandings about how and when power might be exercised legitimately. Through st um, <coughs> uh. So I've been thinking about these topics recently because I've been engaged in this sort of larger project, um, which I will hopefully see through to completion one day, on law and society in medieval and early modern Europe, which is a kind of uh, broad, synthetic, social and cultural history of the law um, as a kind of, again, as a social and cultural phenomenon um, in the early medieval and early modern period. And this has led me to thinking about two concepts that have been very central, that I've found very central in debates among legal scholars, anthropologists, and others who study the relationship between law and society. And I think that these are both very sort of useful and necessary for our understanding of the old regime state. And the first is that of legal pluralism. That is the idea that the sources of law and the sources of legal authority um, are not unitary, or are not necessarily unitary, but can come from uh, different locations. Uh, ecclesiastical law, um, natural law, uh, customary law, positive law, <coughs> and can also be embedded in a variety of institutions which maybe are rela related to each other but which do not necessarily have to exist in a single unified hierarchy but rather kind of overlap and compete with each other. And I think here there's a really useful contrast to be drawn between the image of Bodinian sovereignty where sort of all power emanates from the monarch um, and the reality where much of the law escaped in early modern France, where much of the law escaped to the monarch's control and remained under the power of not just judges and lawyers, but also again the, the sort of the litigants and the witnesses and the parties who participated in the legal system. Here I think, uh, you know, here I'm thinking of a book by one of Jim's students, Zoe Schneider, which I think did an excellent job of showing that for 17th and 18th century Normandy. That is, legal pluralism was at the core of the negotiated power relations that uh, really kind of formed the foundation of Jim's understanding of the French state. The other is sort of autonomy, legal autonomy or semi-autonomy. That is, the question of just how independent legal concepts and legal debates and legal principles are from the rest of society and culture. That is, whether they're sort of whether it's a kind of largely internal closed circuit, as Nicholas Luhmann has argued, or whether these sort of legal debates, um, legal uh, arguments, legal principles are much more kind of permeated by other social and political concerns, such as anthropologists such as Sally Falkmore have argued. And here, again, <coughs> sort of applying this to early modern France, I can't help but notice that kings their ministers, the royal officials, as well as those who opposed them in the old regime, always had a tendency, or generally had a tendency, to do so in legal terms. That is, according to the, again, the, the sort of polyphonic language and principles of the law, whether it was Roman law, customary law, history, or other legal sources. That is, 
the law, again, really provided the sort of legitimacy that Jim talks about as a sort of essential condition of political life in the preface to La Monarchie Republicaine. Whatever the sordid realities and backroom deals of pol that, that sort of lie beneath the kind of polit the realities of politics, whether hammered out in the hallways of Versailles or weekly lunches in German restaurants in mid 20th century Connecticut, these had to be expressed, these decisions, um, these actions had to be expressed in certain terms and appeal to certain principles. And those in turn influenced the way people thought about things and, as Bourdieu reminds us, limited the realm of what was politically possible. So I find that much as the, was the case nearly 25 years ago when I headed off to Toulouse to give my first sort of paper as a graduate student, um, that as I'm thinking about historical questions about law and politics, state and society, uh, Jim has already been there. He's already, he's already been teaching me a great deal and that I still have a great deal to learn from him and that I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. <clears throat>